Who was St. Swithin? What was he famous for? How did his cult spread? And finally, how did St. Swithin fit into the wider picture of the cult of saints and the medieval ideas surrounding pilgrimage and piety? Over the next few minutes, this short documentary will endeavour to answer these questions. Swithin in a broader context, we must understand something about who he was and what he did in his lifetime. So we've come to Winchester Cathedral to interview Chris Tulk, one of the guys, to find out a bit more about him. Well, there's been controversy about St Swithin from day one, and his story has really got more twists than an Agatha Christie mystery story. For a start, we know very little about him. We don't even know what his name means. Swinholm could mean pig man. Maybe his father kept pigs, in which case he would have been fairly affluent. And that would have explained why young Swithin was able to be taught to read and write in an age when many people weren't able to read and write. And why he was then able to go on and attain a very high office. After Swithin's death, he became recognised as a saint. This was due to the support of the Bishop of Winchester and the local people. This made St Swithin different to the majority of medieval saints. We will understand this once we look at canonisation. The process by which a person is declared to be a saint is known as canonisation. The earliest known decree of canonisation was of Ulrich, Bishop of Augsburg, who was declared a saint by Pope John XV in 993. But the process goes back further than this. It was in fact a practice of the early church in order to pay homage to people who died for their faith, the martyrs. Their dedication created a reaction of emotion and veneration within people of the faith which developed into the creation of different cults. These early saints included the martyrs Stephen and Polycarp. As the centuries progressed, the process of becoming a saint became less drastic. People who had lived holy lives could also be regarded as saints, and this is the category into which St. Swithin falls. The years that followed this, the title of saint was bestowed by popular acclamation. Therefore, there was no official process by which someone was declared a saint. However, these saints' cults would tend to be restricted to a limited area, such as their village. St. Swithin is regarded as a popular saint, but unlike other popular saints. His cult was not restricted to a localised area but spread all across the country and from the records of Winchester we can establish that the cult of St Swithin was the second most popular during the medieval period. Following canonisation the remains of a saint were translated from their tomb to a new shrine. The date of this translation was subsequently celebrated as an annual feast and commonly pilgrims visited both the shrine and the site of the tomb. These shrines formed an essential aspect of the life of medieval English cathedrals. The shrines throughout England were constructed to a certain pattern. The upper structure contained the relics of the saint. This could include the whole body or individual bones. At first, Swithin included his whole body, but over time, these parts became distributed around the country and even went abroad to France and Norway. This was then usually supported by a shrine base, which sometimes had holes in it so that pilgrims could feel closer to the saint that we see here. It was often topped by a canopy, which could be raised for the masses when visiting. Another common feature 
of the medieval shrine was the lavish decoration, often including gold, silver, precious gems and marble. In 974, Swithin's shrine was enhanced by a generous donation from King Edgar of 300 pounds of gold, silver and rubies. Thomas Becket's shrine in Canterbury was even more expensive. His body was translated in 1220 to a magnificent shrine in the Trinity Chapel. The relics lay in a golden casing resting upon a stone foundation and were protected by a wooden box suspended by ropes from the roof. Erasmus tells us that when this outer box was raised, inestimable treasures were opened to view. The least valuable parts were of gold, but every part glistened and shone with sparkling, rare and very large jewels, some of them larger than a goose's egg. Medieval pilgrims visited shrines to seek atonement for their sins, to be cured of disease and to ask for help in their everyday lives. As a saint's reputation grew through the promotion of their miracles, pilgrim numbers generally increased. At Winchester, Swithin attracted so many people due to his reputation for healing that the inns of Winchester could not accommodate them all. In Edward I's reign, the monks of St Swithin's Priory had to finance a new hall for them, known as the Strangers' Hall. Winchester at that time was a great centre for trade and people were coming into Winchester to trade and they would hear stories of the miracles that were supposedly taking place uh, and of course the present cathedral would have been here by then and Swithin's shrine would have been up by the high altar. Pilgrims would have made it not only a trading place but a place of pilgrimage as well. And of course don't forget he was credited with all kinds of healing and they said that there were stools and walking sticks and crutches all thrown down there Miracles of healing had occurred, and they were no longer necessary. Better than the NHS. <laughs> However, it was not always a good thing to attract large crowds to a saint's shrine. The monks of St Marshall in 1018 found that the stream of the crowd, like a flowing river into the church and rushing into the tomb of Blessed Marshall, turned in upon itself from an accident, and one person trampled the other. And thus, more than 50 men and women were trampled by each other and died on the spot. Incidents such as this clearly show that the cult of saints was of immense importance to the laity of the medieval period. A powerful testimony of the importance of St. Swithin's cult is the amount of churches dedicated to his name. By the mid-12th century, Swithin was not only named as the sole patron of Winchester Cathedral, but also had two maybe three other churches in Winchester. Additionally, it has been documented that there were another 64 dedications throughout England. In this respect, he rates far above other Anglo-Saxon saints. Important shrines in the Middle Ages included those of St. Winifred's Well, Linda's Farm, Glastonbury, Bromholm, and St. Albans. When people arrived at the shrine, they would pay money to be allowed to look at these holy relics. In some cases, pilgrims were even allowed to touch and kiss them. The keeper of the shrine would also give the pilgrim a metal badge that had been stamped with the symbol of the shrine. These badges were then fixed to the pilgrim's hat so the people would know that they had visited the shrine. Offerings made at the shrines formed an important source of revenue for the many cathedrals. In particular, they helped fund major building campaigns at Lincoln, Hereford and Rochester. It was also true for Bishop Athelwold of Winchester Cathedral. This is the last resting place of St Swithin, and he's remained so popular that this was dedicated to him in 1962. Indeed, he's so popular today that there was a golden cloth over this, but people kept taking sequins off it, much like old pilgrims would, so it had to be removed.